Story 9 of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 9, Humoresque, Part 1, by Fanny Hurst, from Cosmopolitan. On either side of the Bowery, which cuts through like a drain to catch its sewage, every man's land, a reeking march of humanity and humidity, steams with the excrement of seventeen languages flung in patois from tenement windows fire escapes curbs stoops and cellars whose walls are terrible and spongy with fungi by that impregnable chemistry of race whereby the red blood of the bongolian and the red blood of the caucasian become as oil and water in the mingling mulberry street bounded by sixteen languages runs its intact latin length of pushcarts clotheslines naked babies drying vermicelli black-eyed women in rhinestone combs and perennially big with child whole families of buttonhole makers who first saw the blue and gold light of sorrento bent at homework around a single gas flare pomaded barbers of a thousand neapolitan amours and then just as suddenly almost without osmosis and by the mere stepping down from the curb mulberry becomes mott street hung in grillwork balconies the mouldy smell of poverty touched up with incense orientals whose feet shuffle and whose faces are carved out of satin wood forbidden women their white drugged faces behind upper windows yellow children incongruous enough in western clothing a draughty areaway with an oblique of gaslight and a black well of descending staircase show windows of jade and tea and chinese porcelains more streets emanating out from mott like a handful of crooked rheumatic fingers then suddenly the bowery again cowering beneath elevated trains where men burned down to the butt end of soiled lives pass in and out and out and in of the knee-high swinging doors a veiny nosed acid-eaten race in themselves allen street too still more easterly and half as wide is straddled its entire width by the steely long-legged skeleton of elevated traffic so that its third-floor windows no sooner shudder into silence from the rushing shock of one train than they are shaken into chatter by the passage of another indeed third-floor dwellers of allen street reaching out can almost touch the serrated edges of the elevated structure and in summer the smell of its hot rails becomes an actual taste in the mouth passengers in turn look in upon this horizontal of life as they whiz by once in fact the blurry figure of what might have been a woman leaned out as she passed to toss into one abram cantor's apartment a short-stemmed pink carnation it hit softly on little leon cantor's crib brushing him fragrantly across the mouth and causing him to pucker up beneath where even in august noonday the sun cannot find its way by a chink and babies lie stark naked in the cavernous shade allen street presents a sort of submarine and greenish gloom as if its humanity were actually moving through a sea of aqueous shadows faces rather bleached and shrunk from sunlessness as water can bleach and shrink and then like a shimmering background of orange finned and copper flanked marine life the brass shops of allen street whole rows of them burn flamelessly and without benefit of fuel to enter abram cantor's brasses was three steps down so that his casement show window at best filmed over with the constant rain of dust ground down from the rails above was obscure enough but crammed with the copied loot of khedive and of czar the seven-branch candlestick so biblical and supplicating of arms an urn shaped like rebecca's of brass all beaten over with little pokes things cups trays knockers icons gargoyles bowls and teapots a symphony of bells in graduated sizes jardinieres with fat sides 
a pot-bellied samovar, a swinging lamp for the dead, star-shaped. Against the door, an octave of tubular chimes, prisms of voiceless harmony and of heatless light. Opening this door, they rang gently, like melody heard through water and behind glass. Another bell rang, too, in tilted sing-song from a pulley operated somewhere in the catacomb rear of this lambent veil of things, and things, and things. In turn, this pulley set in toll still another bell, two flights up in Abram Cantor's tenement, which overlooked the front of whizzing rails and a rear wilderness of gibbet-looking clotheslines, dangling perpetual specters of flapping union suits in a mid-air flaky with soot. Often at lunch, or even the evening meal, this bell would ring in on Abram Cantor's digestive well-being and while he hurried down, napkin often bib-fashion still about his neck, and into the smouldering lanes of copper, would leave an eloquent void at the head of his well-surrounded table. This bell was ringing now, jingling in upon the slumber of a still newer canter, snuggling peacefully enough within the ammoniac depths of a cradle recently evacuated by Leon, heretofore impinged upon you. On her knees, before an oven that billowed forth hotly into her face, Mrs. Cantor, fairly fat and not yet forty, and at the immemorial task of plumbing a delicately swelling layer cake with broom straw, raised her face, reddened and faintly moist. Isidore, run down and say your papa is out until six. If it's a customer, remember the first asking price is the two middle figures on the tag, and the last asking price is the two outside figures. See once, with your papa out to buy your little brother his birthday present, and your mother in a cake, if you can't make a sale for first price. Isidore Cantor, aged eleven, and hunched with a younger Cantor over an oilcloth-covered table, hunched himself still deeper in barter for a large crystal marble with a candy stripe down its center. Izzy, did you hear me? Yes, um. Go down this minute, do you hear? Rudolph, stop always letting your big brother get the best of you in marbles. Izzy, in a minute. Don't let me have to ask you again, Isidore Cantor. Aw, oh, Ma, I got some arithmetic to do. Let Esther go. Always Esther. Your sister stays right in the front room with her spelling. Aw, oh, Ma, I got spelling, too. Every time I ask that boy he should do me one thing, right away he gets lessons. With me, that lesson talk don't go no more. Every time you get put down in school, I'm surprised there's a place left lower than where they can put you. Working papers for such a boy like you. Ah, woik! How I worried myself. Violin lessons yet. Thirty cents lesson out of your papa's pants while he slept that's how i wanted to have in a family a profession maybe a musician on the violin lessons for you out of money i had to lie to your papa about honest when i think of it my own husband it's a wonder i don't pot you just for remembering it rudolph will you stop licking that cake pan it's saved for your little brother leon ain't you ashamed even on your little brother's birthday to steal from him ma give me the spoon I'll give you the spoon, Isidore Cantor, where you don't want it. If you don't hurry down the way that bell is ringing, not one bite out of your little brother's birthday cake tonight. I'm going, ain't I? Always on my children's birthdays a meanness sets into this house. Rudolph, will you put down that bowl? Izzy, for the last time I ask you, for the last time. Erect now, Mrs. Cantor lifted a portentous hand, letting it hover. "'I'm going, Ma. For golly sake, I'm going,' said her recalcitrant one, shuffling off toward the staircase, shuffling, shuffling. Then Mrs. Cantor resumed her plumbing, and through the little apartment, its middle and only bedroom of three beds and a crib, lighted vicariously by the front room and kitchen, began to wind the warm, the golden-brown fragrance of cake in the rising. By six o'clock the shades were drawn against the dirty dusk of Allen Street, 
and the oilcloth covered table dragged out center and spread by esther Cantor, nine in years in the sturdy little legs bulging over shoe tops in the pink cheeks that sagged slightly of plumpness and in the utter roundness of face and gaze but mysteriously older in the little mother lore of crib and knee dandling ditties and in the ropey length and thickness of the two brown plates down her back there was an eloquence to that waiting laid-out table the print of the family already gathered about it the dynastic high chair throne of each succeeding cantor an armchair drawn up before the paternal moustache cup the ordinary kitchen chair of manny cantor who spilled things an oilcloth sort of bib dangling from its back the little chair of leon cantor cushioned in an old family album that raised his chin above the table even in cutlery the cantor family was not lacking in variety surrounding a centerpiece of thick russian lace were russian spoons washed in washed-off gilt forks of one two and three tines steel knives with black handles a hartshorn carving knife thick-lipped china in stacks before the armchair a round four-pound loaf of black bread waiting to be torn and to-night on the festive mat of cotton lace a cake of pinkly gleaming icing encircled with five pink little twisted candles at slightly after six abram cantor returned leading by a resisting wrist leon cantor his stem-like little legs hit amidship as it were by not sufficiently cut down trousers and so narrow and bird-like of face that his eyes quite obliterated the remaining map of his features like those of a still wet nestling all except his ears they poised at the sides of leon's shaved head of black bristles as if butterflies had just lighted there whispering with very spread wings their message and presently would fly off again by some sort of muscular contraction he could wiggle these ears at will and would do so for a penny a whistle and upon one occasion for his brother rudolph's dead rat so devised as to dangle from string and window before the unhappy passer-by they were quivering now these ears but because the entire little face was twitching back tears and gulp of sobs abram leon what is it her hands and her forearm instantly went out from the business of kneading something meaty and flowery mrs cantor rushed forward her glance quick from one to the other of them abram what's wrong i'll feedle him i'll feedle him the little pulling wrist still in clutch mr cantor regarded his wife the lower half of his face well covered with reddish bristles undershot his free hand and even his eyes violently lifted to those who see in a man a perpetual kinship to that animal kingdom of which he is supreme there was something undeniably anthropoidal about abram cantor a certain simian width between the eyes and long rather agile hands with hairy backs hush it cried mr cantor his free hand raised in threat of descent and uh, cowering his small son to still more undersized proportions hush it or by golly i'll abram abram what is it then mr cantor gave vent in acridity of word and feature schlemiel he cried momser ganef nebish by which abram cantor in smiting mother tongue branded his offspring with attributes of apostate and never do well of idiot and thief abram schlemiel repeated mr abram swinging leon so that he described a large semicircle that landed him into the meaty and waiting embrace of his mother take him you should be proud of such a little momser for a son take him and here you got back his birthday dollar a feedle honest when i think on it a feedle such a rush of outrage seemed fairly to strangle mr cantor that he stood hand still upraised choking and inarticulate above the now frankly howling huddle of his son abram you should just once touch this child how he trembles 
Leon, mamma's baby, what is it? Is this how you come back when papa takes you out to buy your birthday present? Ain't you ashamed? Mouth distended to a large and blackly hollow O, Leon, between terrifying spells of breath-holding, continued to howl. All the way to Naftel's toy store I drag him. A birthday present for a dollar his mother wants he should have. All right, a birthday present. I give you my word till I'm ashamed for Naftel. Every toy on his shelves is pulled down. Such a cow that shakes with his head. No, no, no. This from young Leon, beating at his mother's skirts. Again the upraised but never quite descending hand of his father. By golly, I'll no no you abram go away baby what did papa do then mr cantor broke into an actual tarantella of rage his hands palms up and dancing what did papa do she asked she's got easy asking what did papa do the whole shop i tell you a sheep with a ba inside when you squeeze on him games a horn so he can holler my head off such a knife like izzy's with a scissors in it leon i said ashamed for naftel that's a fine knife like izzy so you can cut up with all right then when i see how he hollers such a box full of soldiers to have war with dollar seventy-five says naftel all right then i says when i seen how he keeps hollering give you a dollar fifteen for em i should make myself small for fifteen cents more dollar fifteen i says anything so he should shut up with his hollering for what he seen in the window he seen something in the window he wanted abram didn't i tell you a fiddle a four dollar fiddle a musicker so we should have another fiddler in the family for some thirty cents lessons abram you mean he a, a leon wanted a, a violin wanted she says i could potch him again this minute for how he wanted it do you little bum you chommer momser i'll feedle you across mrs cantor's face as she knelt there in the shapeless cotton stuff uniform of poverty through the very tenement of her body a light had flashed up into her eyes she drew her son closer crushing his puny cheek up against hers cupping his bristly little head in her by no means immaculate palms he wanted a violin it's come abram the dream of all my life it's come i knew it must be one of my children if i waited long enough and prayed enough a musician he wants a violin he cried for a violin my baby why darling mamma sell her clothes off her back to get you a violin he's a musician abram i should have known it the way he's fooling always around the chimes and the bells in the store then mrs cantor took to rocking his head between her palms oi oi the mother is crazier as her son a musician a freezer you mean such an eater it's a wonder he ain't twice too big instead of twice too little for his age that's a sign abram they all eat big for all we know he's a genius i swear to you abram all the months before he was born i prayed for it each one before they came i prayed it should be the one i thought that time the way our isidore ran after the organ grinder he would be the one how could i know it was the monkey he wanted when isidore wouldn't take it i prayed my next one and then my next one should have the talent i've prayed for it abram if he wants a violin please he should have it not with my money with mine i've got enough saved abram them three extra dollars right here inside my own waist that i'd save toward the cape down on grand street i wouldn't have it now the way they say the wind blows up them i tell you the woman's crazy i feel it i know he's got talent i know my children so well a, a father don't understand i'm so next to them it's like i can tell always everything that will happen to them it's like a pain somewhere here in back of my heart a pain in the heart she gets for my own children i'm always a prophet i tell you you think i didn't know that that terrible night after the pogrom after we got out of kiev to cross the border you remember abram how i predicted it to you then how our manny would be born too soon and not ripe from my suffering 
Did it happen on the ship to America just the way I said it would? Did it happen just exactly how I predicted our Izzy would break his leg that time playing on the fire escape? I tell you, Abram, I got a real pain here under my heart that tells me what comes to my children. Didn't I tell you how Esther would be the first in her confirmation class and our baby Boris would be red-headed? At only five years, our Leon, all by himself, cries for a fiddle. Get it for him, Abram. Get it for him. I tell you, Sarah, I got a crazy woman for a wife. It ain't enough we celebrate eight birthdays a year with one dollar presents each time and copper goods every day higher. It ain't enough that right tomorrow I got a fifty dollar note over me from Saul Ginsburg, a four dollar present she wants for a child that don't even know the name of a fiddle. Leon, baby, stop hollering. Papa will go back and get the fiddle for you now before supper. See, Mama's got money here in her waist. Papa will go back for the fetal knot. Three dollars she saved for herself. He can holler out for her for a fetal. Abram, he's screaming, so he, he'll have a fit. He should have two fits. Darling, I tell you the way you spoil your children, it will some day come back on us. It's his birthday night, Abram, five years since his little head first lay on the pillow next to me. All right, all right, drive me crazy because he's got a birthday. Leon, baby, if you don't stop hollering, you'll make yourself sick. Abram, I never saw him like this. He's green. I'll green him. Where is that old fetal from Isadora, that seventy-five cent one? I never thought of that. You broke it that time you got mad at Isadora's lessons. I'll run down. Maybe it's with the junk behind the store. I never thought of that fiddle. Leon, darling, wait. Mama, run down and look. Wait, Leon till mama finds you a fiddle the raucous screams stopped then suddenly and on their very lustiest crest leaving an echoing gash across the silence on willing feet of haste mrs cantor wound down backward the high ladder-like staircase that led to the brass shop meanwhile to a gnawing consciousness of dinner hour had assembled the house of cantor attuned to the intimate atmosphere of the tenement which is so constantly rent with cry of child childbearing delirium delirium tremens leon cantor had howled no impression into the motley din of things isidore already astride his chair well into centre table for first vociferous tear at a four-pound loaf esther cantor old at chores settled an infant into the high chair careful of tiny fingers and lowering the wooden bib papa izzy's eating first again put down that loaf and wait until your mother dishes up or you'll get a pot you won't soon forget say pop don't say pop me i don't want no street bum freshness from you i mean papa there was an uptown swell in and she bought one of them seventy-five cent candlesticks for the first price Schlemiel, jammer, said Mr. Cantor, rinsing his hands at the sink. Didn't I always tell you it's the first price times two when you see uptown business come in? Haven't I learned it to you often enough a slummer must pay for her nosiness? There entered then on the poor shuffling feed Manny Cantor, so marred in the mysterious and ceramic process of life that the brain and the soul had stayed back sooner than inhabit him seventeen in years in the down upon his face and in growth unretarded by any great nervosity of system his vacuity of face was not that of childhood but rather as if his light eyes were peering out from some hinterland and wanting so terribly and so dumbly to communicate what they beheld to brain cells closed against himself at sight of manny leon cantor the tears still wetly and dirtily down his cheeks left off his black fierce-eyed stare of waiting long enough to smile darkly it is true but sweetly giddy up he cried giddy up and then manny true to habit would scamper and scamper up out of the trap-like stair opening came the head of mrs cantor disheveled and a smudge of soot across her face 
but beneath her arm triumphant a violin of one string and a broken back see leon what mamma has got a violin a fiddle look the bow too i found it ain't much baby but it's a fiddle ah oh, ma that's my old violin gimme i want it where'd you find hush up izzy this ain't yours no more see leon what mamma brought you a violin now you little chammer you got a fiddle and if you never let me hear you holler again for a fiddle by golly if i don't from his corner leon cantor reached out taking the instrument and fitting it beneath his chin the bow immediately feeling surely and lightly for string look abram he knows how to hold it what did i tell you a child that never in his life seen a fiddle except a beggar on the street little esther suddenly cantered down floor clapping her chubby hands looky looky leon the baby ceased clattering his spoon against the wooden bib a silence seemed to shape itself so black and so bristly of head his little claw-like hands hovering over the bow leon cantor withdrew a note strangely round and given up almost sobbingly from the single string a note of warm twining quality like a baby's finger leon darling fumbling for string and for notes the instrument could not yield up to him the bird-like mouth began once more to open widely and terribly into the orificial o oh. it was then abram cantor came down with a large hollow resonance of palm against the aperture lifting his small son and depositing him plop upon the family album take that by golly one more whimper out of you and if i don't make you black and blue birthday or no birthday dish up sarah quick or i'll give him something to cry about the five pink candles had been lighted burning pointedly and with tender little smoky wisps regarding them owlishly the tears dried on leon's face his little tongue licking up at them look how solemn he is like he was thinking of something a million miles away except how lucky he is he should have a pink birthday cake uh uh don't you begin to holler again here i'm putting the fetal next to you uh 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 to a meal plentifully ladled out directly from stove to table the cantor family drew up dipping first into the rich black soup of the occasion all except mrs cantor esther you dish up i'm going somewhere i'll be back in a minute where are you going sarah won't it keep until but even in the face of query sarah cantor was two flights down and well through the lambent aisles of the copper shop outside she broke into a run through two blocks of the indescribable bizarre atmosphere of grand street then one block to the right before naphtel's show-window a jet of bright gas burned into a jabberwock land of toys there was that in sarah cantor's face that was actually lyrical as fumbling at the bosom of her dress she entered to leon cantor by who knows what symphonic scheme of things life was a chromatic scale yielding up to him through throbbing living nerves of sheep gut the sheerest semitones of man's emotions when he tucked his stradivarius beneath his chin the book of life seemed suddenly translated to him in melody even sarah cantor who still brewed for him on a small portable stove carried from city to city and surreptitiously unpacked in hotel suites the blackest of soups and despite his protestation would encase his ears of nights in an old home-made device against their flightiness would oftentimes bleed inwardly at this sense of his isolation there was a realm into which he went alone leaving her as detached as the merest ticket purchaser at the box office at seventeen leon cantor had played before the crowned heads of europe the aching heads of american capital and even the shaved head of a south sea prince there was a layout of anecdotal gifts from their molar tooth of the south sea prince set in a south sea pearl to a blue enamel snuff-box encrusted with the rearing lion coat of arms of a very royal house 
At eighteen came the purchase of a king's Stradivarius for a king's ransom, and acclaimed by Sunday supplements to repose of nights in an ivory cradle. At nineteen, under careful auspices of press agent, the ten singing digits of the son of Abram Cantor were insured at $10,000 the finger. At twenty he had emerged surely and safely from the perilous quicksands which have sucked down whole Lilliputian worlds of infant prodigies. At twenty-one, when Leon Cantor played a Sunday night concert, there was a human queue curling entirely around the square block of the opera house, waiting its one, two, even three and four hours for the privilege of standing room only. Usually these were Leon Cantor's own people, pouring up from the lowly lands of the east side to the white lands of Broadway, parched for music, these burning brethren of his, old men in that line frequently carrying their own little folding camp chairs, not against weariness of the spirit but of the flesh, youth with Slavic eyes and cheekbones, these were the six deep human phalanx which presently slant down at him from tiers of steepest balconies and stand frankly emotional and jammed in the unreserved space behind the railing which shut them off from the three-dollar seats of the reserve. At a very special one of these concerts, dedicated to the meager purses of just these, and held in New York's super opera house, the amphitheatre, a great bowl of humanity, the metaphor made perfect by tiers of seats placed upon the stage, rose from orchestra to dome. A gigantic coliseum of a cup, lined in stacks and stacks of faces. From the door of his dressing-room, leaning out, Leon Cantor could see a great segment of it buzzing down into adjustment, orchestra twitting and tuning into it. In a bare little room, illuminated by a sheaf of roses just arrived, Mrs. Cantor drew him back by the elbow. "'Leon, you're in a draft. The amazing years had dealt kindly with Mrs. Cantor. Stouter, softer, apparently even taller, she was full of small new authorities that could shut out cranks, newspaper reporters, and autograph fiends. A fitted over corsets, black taffeta, and a high comb in the graying hair had done their best with her. Pride, too, had left its flush upon her cheeks, like two rounded spots of fever. "'Leon, it's thirty minutes till your first number. Close that door. Do you want to let your papa and his excitement in on you?' The son of Sarah Cantor obeyed, leaning on his short, rather narrow form in silhouette against the closed door. In spite of slimly dark evening clothes, worked out by an astute manager to the last detail in boyish effects, there was that about him which defied long-haired precedent. Slimly and straightly he had shot up into an unmannered, a short, even a bristly-haired young manhood, disqualifying by a close shave for the older school of hirsute virtuosity but his nerves did not spare him. On concert nights they seemed to emerge almost to the surface of him and shriek their exposure. Just feel my hands, ma, like ice. She dived down into her large silk whatnot of a reticule. I've got your fleece-lined gloves here, son. No, no, for God's sake, not those things, no. He was back at the door again, opening it to a slit, peering through. They're bringing more seats on the stage. If they crowd me in, I won't go on. I can't play if I hear them breathe. Hi, out there, no more chairs. Pa, Hancock. Leon, Leon, ain't you ashamed to get so worked up? Close that door. Have you got a manager who's paid just to see to your comfort? When Papa comes, I'll have him go out and tell Hancock you don't want chairs so close to you. Leon, will you mind, Mama? and sit down. It's a bigger house than the royal concert in Madrid, ma. Why, I never saw anything like it. It's a stampede. God, this is real. This is what gets me playing for my own. I should have given a concert like this three years ago. I'll do it every year now. I'd rather play before them than all the crowned heads on earth. It's the biggest night of my life. 
They're rioting out there, ma, rioting to get in. Leon, Leon, won't you sit down if mamma begs you to? He sat then, strumming with all ten fingers upon his knees. Try to get quiet, son. Count like you always do. One, two, three. Please, ma, for God's sake, please, please. Look, such beautiful roses from Saul Ginsburg, an old friend of Papa's he used to buy brasses from eighteen years ago. Six years he's been away with his daughter in Munich. Such a beautiful mezzo, they say, engaged already for Metropolitan next season. I hate it, Ma, if they breathe on my neck. Leon, darling, did Mama promise to fix it? Have I ever let you plan a concert where you wouldn't be comfortable? His long, slim hand suddenly prehensile and cutting a long upward gesture, Leon Cantor rose to his feet, face whitening. Do it now! Now, I tell you, I won't have them breathe on me. Do you hear me? Now, now, now! Risen also, her face soft and tremulous for him, Mrs. Cantor put out a gentle, a sedative hand upon his sleeve. Son, she said with an edge of authority even behind her smile, don't holler at me. He grasped her hand with his too, and immediately quiet, placed a close string of kisses along it. Mama, he said, kissing them again and again into the palm. Mama, mama. I know, son, it's nerves. They eat me, ma, feel. I'm like ice. I didn't mean it. You know I didn't mean it. My baby, she said, my wonderful boy. It's like I can never get used to the wonder of having you. The greatest one of them all should be mine, a plain woman's like mine. He teased her, eager to conciliate and ride down his own state of quivering. Now, Ma, now, now, don't forget Remsky. Remsky, a man three times your age who was playing concerts before you was born. Is that a comparison? From your clippings book I can show Rimsky who the world considers the greatest violinist. Rimsky, he rubs into me. All right, then, the press clippings, but did Elsus, the greatest manager of them all, bring me a contract for thirty concerts at two thousand a concert? Now I've got you, now. She would not meet his laughter. Elsass, believe me, he'll come to you yet. My boy would worry if he makes fifty thousand a year more or less. Rimsky should have that honor, for so long as he can hold it. But he won't hold it long. Believe me, I don't rest easy in my bed till Elsass comes after you. Not for so big a contract like Rimsky's, but bigger. Not for thirty concerts, but for fifty. Brava, brava, there's a woman for you more money than she knows what to do with, and then not satisfied. She was still too tremulous for banter. Not satisfied? Why, Leon, I never stop praying my thanks for you. All right, then, he cried, laying his icy fingers on her cheek. Tomorrow we'll call a mignon, a regular old-fashioned Allen Street prayer party. Leon, you mustn't make fun. Make fun of the sweetest girl in this room? Girl? Ah, if I could only hold you by me this way, Leon, always a boy, with me, your poor old mother, your only girl. That's a fear I suffer with, Leon, to lose you to a girl. That's how selfish the mother of such a wonder child like mine can get to be. All right, trying to get me married off again. Nice, fine. Is it any wonder I suffer, son? Twenty-one years to have kept you by me a child, a boy that's never in his life was out after midnight except to catch trains, a boy that never has so much as looked at a girl and could have looked at princesses, to have kept you all these years, mine, is it any wonder, son, I never stop praying my thanks for you? You don't believe Hancock, son, the way he keeps teasing you always, you should have a what he calls affair, a love affair? Such talk is not nice, Leon, an affair. Love affair, poppycock, said Leon Cantor, lifting his mother's face and kissing an eye about ready to tear. Why, I've got something, Ma, right here in my heart for you that— Leon, be careful, your shirt front. That's so, so what you call tender for my best sweetheart, 
that I owe love of fair poppycock. She would not let her tears come. My boy, my wonder boy. There goes the overture, ma. Here, darling, your glass of water. I can't stand it in here. I'm suffocating. Got your mute in your pocket, son? Yes, ma, for God's sake, yes. Don't keep asking things. Ain't you ashamed, Leon, to be in such an excitement? For every concert you get worse. The chairs, they'll breathe on my neck. Leon, did Mama promise you those chairs would be moved? Where's Hancock? Say, I'm grateful if he stays out. It took me enough work to get this room cleared. You know your papa, he likes to drag in the whole world to show you off. Always before you play. The minute he walks in the room, right away he gets everybody to trembling just from his own excitement. I dare him this time he should bring people. No dignity has that man got, the way he brings every one. End of Story 9, Part 1《Story 9 of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Story 9, Humoresque, Part 2, by Fanny Hurst. Even upon her word came a rattling of door, of doorknob, and a voice through the clamor, Open! Quick! Sarah! Leon! A stiffening raced over Mrs. Cantor so that she sat rigid on her chair edge, lips compressed, eye darkly upon the shivering door. Open, Sarah! With a narrowing glance, Mrs. Cantor laid to her lips a forefinger of silence. Sarah, it's me! Quick, I say! Then from Leon Cantor sprang up the old prehensile gesture of curving fingers shooting up. For God's sake, Ma, let him in. I can't stand that infernal battering. Abram, go away. Leon's got to have quiet before his concert. Just a minute, Sarah. Open, quick. With a spring, his son was at the door, unlocking and flinging it back. Come in, Pa. The years had weighed heavily upon Abram Cantor in Avodupoi only. He was himself plus eighteen years, fifty pounds, and a new sleek pomposity that was absolutely oleaginous. It shone roundly in his face, doubling of chin, in the bulge of waistcoat, heavily gold-chained, and in eyes that behind the gold-rimmed glasses gave sparklingly forth his estate of well-being. Abram, didn't I tell you not to dare to? On excited balls of feet that fairly bounced him, Abram Cantor burst in. Leon, Mama, I got here an old friend, Saul Ginsberg, you remember, Mama, from Brass's. Abram, not now. Go away with your not now. I want Leon should meet him. Saul, this is him, a little grown up from such a nebbish like you remember him. Eh? Sarah, you remember Saul Ginsburg? Say, I should ask you if you remember your right hand. Ginsburg and Azel, the firm. This is his girl, a five years contract signed yesterday. Five hundred dollars an opera for a beginner. Six rolls, not bad, ne? Eh? Abram, you must ask Mr. Ginsburg, please, to excuse Leon until after his concert. Shake hands with him, Ginsburg. He's had his hand shook enough in his life, and by kings, too. Shake it once more with an old bouncer like you. Mr. Ginsburg, not unlike his colleague in rotundities, held out a short, dimpled hand. It's a proud day, he said, for me to shake the hands from my old friend's son and the finest violinist living today. My little daughter. Yes, yes, Gina. Here, shake hands with him, Leon. They say a voice like a fountain. Gina Berg, uh, Ginsburg, uh, is how you stage named her. You hear, Mama, how fancy Gina Berg? We go hear her, eh? There was about Miss Gina Ginsburg, whose voice could soar to the tira lira of a lark and then deepen to mezzo, something of the actual slimness of the poor maligned Elsa, so long buried beneath the buxomness of divas. She was like a little flower that in its cranniest nook keeps dewy longest. How do you do, Leon Cantor? There was a whir through her English of three acquired languages. How do you do? We, father and I, travelled once all the way from Brussels to Dresden to hear you play. It was worth it. 
I shall never forget how you played the Humoresque. It made me laugh and cry. You like Brussels? She laid her little hand to her heart, half closing her eyes. I will never be so happy again as with the sweet little people of Brussels. I, too, love Brussels. I studied there four years with Arenfest. I know you did. My teacher Lindahl in Berlin was his brother-in-law. You have studied with Lindahl? He is my master. I will I sometimes hear you sing? I am not yet great. When I am foremost like you, yes. Gina, Gina Berg, that is a beautiful name to make famous. You see how it is done? Jens, Berg, Gina, Berg. Clever! They stood then smiling across a chasm of the diffidence of youth, she fumbling at the great fur pelt out of which her face flowered so dewily. I, well, uh, we are uh, in the fourth box. I guess we had better be going. Fourth box left. He wanted to find words, but for consciousness of self could not. It's a wonderful house out there waiting for you, Leon Cantor, and you, you're wonderful too. The flowers, thanks. My father, he sent them. Come, father, quick. Suddenly there was a tight tensity that seemed to crowd up the little room. Abram, quick, get Hancock. That first row of chairs has got to be moved. There he is in the wings. See the piano ain't dragged down too far. Leon, got your mute on your pocket? Please, Mr. Ginsburg, you must excuse. Here, Leon, is your glass of water. Drink it, I say. Shut that door out there, boy, so there ain't a draft in the wings. Here, Leon, your violin. Get neckerchief? Listen, how they're shouting. It's for you, Leon, darling. Go! In the center of that vast human bowl, which had finally shouted itself out, slim, boy-like, and in his supreme isolation, Leon Conter drew bow and a first thin, pellucid, and perfect note into a silence breathless to receive it. Throughout the arduous flexuosities of the Mendelssohn E minor concerto, singing, winding from tonal to tonal climax, and out of the slow movement, which is like a tourniquet twisting the heart into the spirited allegro molto vivace, it was as if beneath Leon Cantor's fingers the strings were living vein chords, youth, vitality, and the very foam of exuberance racing through them that was the power of him the vichy and the sparkle of youth so that playing the melody poured round him like wine and went down seething and singing into the hearts of his hearers later and because these were his people and because they were dark and slavic with his slavic darkness he played as if his very blood were weeping the kol nidra which is the prayer of his race for atonement and then the super amphitheatre filled with those whose emotions lie next to the surface and whose pores have not been closed over with a watertight veneer burst into its cheers and its tears there were fifteen recalls from the wings abram counter standing counting them off on his fingers and trembling to receive the stradivarius then finally and against the frantic negative pantomime of his manager a scherzo played so lacily that it swept the house in lightest laughter when leon Cantor finally completed his program they were loath to let him go crowding down the aisles upon him applauding up down round him until the great dishevelled house was like the roaring of a sea and he would laugh and throw out his arms in widespread helplessness and always his manager in the background gesticulating against too much of his precious product for the money ushers already slamming up chairs his father's arms out for the stradivarius and deepest in the gloom of the wings sarah cantor in a rocker especially dragged out for her and from the depth of the black silk reticule darning his socks bravo bravo give us the humoresque chopin nocturne polonaise humoresque bravo bravo and even as they stood hatted and coated importuning and pressing in upon him and with a wisp of a smile to the fourth left box leon Cantor played them the humoresque of dvorak skedaddling plunking quirking that laugh on life with a tear behind it 
then suddenly because he could escape no other way rushed straight back for his dressing-room bursting in upon a flood of family already there before him isadora conter blue-shaven aquiline and already graying at the temples his five-year-old son leon a soft little powder pigeon of a wife too enormous of bust in glittering eardrops and a wrist-watch of diamonds half buried in chubby wrist miss esther cantor pink and pretty rudolph boris not yet done with growing pains at the door miss cantor met her brother her eyes as sweetly moist as her kiss leon darling you surpassed even yourself quit crowding children let him sit down here leon let mamma give you a fresh collar look how the child's perspired pull down that window boris rudolph don't let no one in i give you my word if to-night wasn't as near as i ever came to seeing a house go crazy not even that time in milan darling when they broke down the doors was it like to-night ought to be seen ma the row of police outside hush up rudy don't you see your brother is trying to get his breath from mrs isadore contour you ought to seen the balconies mother isadore and i went up just to see the jam six thousand dollars in the house to-night if there was a cent said isadore cantor hand me my violin please esther i must have scratched it the way they pushed no son you didn't i've already rubbed it up sit quiet darling he was limply white as if the vitality had flowed out of him god wasn't it tremendous six thousand if there was a cent repeated isadore cantor more than rimsky ever played to in his life oh izzy you make me sick always counting counting your sister's right isadore you got nothing to complain of if there was only six hundred in the house a boy whose fiddle has made already enough to set you up in such a fine business his brother boris in such a fine college automobiles style and now because vladimir rimsky three times his age gets signed up with elsass for a few thousand more a year right away the family gets a long face ma please isadore didn't mean it that way pa's knocking ma shall i let him in let him in rudy i'd like to know what good it will do to try to keep him out in an actual rain of perspiration his tie slid well under one ear abram cantor burst in mouthing the words before his acute state of strangulation would let them out elsass it's elsass outside he he, he wants to sign a leon f fifty concerts coast to coast two thousand ne next season he's got the papers ready drawn up the pen outside waiting abram pa in the silence that followed isadore cantor a poppiness of stare and a violent redness set in suddenly turned to his five-year-old son sticky with lollipop and came down soundly and with smack against the infantile the slightly outstanding and unsuspecting ear mumser he cried jammer lump gunnuff you hear that two thousand two thousand didn't i tell you didn't i tell you to practice even as leon cantor put pen to this princely document francis ferdinand of austria the assassin's bullet true lay dead in state and let slip were the dogs of war in the next years men forty deep were to die in piles hayricks of fields to become human hayricks of battlefields belgium disemboweled her very entrails dragging to find all the civilized world her champion and between the poppies of flanders crosses thousands upon thousands of them to mark the places where the youth of her allies fell avenging outrage seas even when calmest were to become terrible and men's heartbeats a bit sluggish with the fatty degeneration of a sluggard peace to quicken and then to throb with the rat a -tat, tat the rat a -tat, tat of the most peremptory the most reverberating call to arms in the history of the world in june nineteen seventeen leon cantor answering that rat a -tat, tat enlisted in november honed by the interim of training to even a new leanness and sailing orders heavy and light in his heart lieutenant cantor on two days home leave took leave of his home which can be cruelest when it is tenderest 
standing there in the expensive the formal the enormous french parlor of his uptown apartment de luxe from not one of whose chairs would his mother's feet touch floor a wall of living flesh mortared in blood was throbbing and hedging him in he would pace up and down the long room heavy with the faces of those who mourn with a laugh too ready too facetious in his fear for them well well what is this anyway awake where's the coffin who's dead his sister-in-law shut out her plump watch encrusted wrist don't lay on she cried such talk is a sin it might come true rosy posy butterball he said pausing beside her chair to pinch her deeply soft cheek cry baby roly-poly you can't shove me off in a wooden kimono that way from his place before the white and gold mantel staring steadfastly at the floor tiling isidore contour turned suddenly a bit whiter and older at the temples don't get your comedy leon wooden kimono leon that's the way the fellows at camp joke about coffins ma i didn't mean anything but fun great scott can't anyone take a joke oh god oh god his mother fell to swaying softly hugging herself against shivering did you sign over power of attorney to pa leon all fixed is he i'm so afraid son you don't take with you enough money in your pockets you know how you lose it if only you would let mamma sew that little bag inside your uniform with a little place for bills and a little place for the astifidity now please ma please if i needed more wouldn't i take it wouldn't i be a pretty joke among the fellows tied up in that smelling stuff orders are orders ma i know what to take and what not to take please leon don't get mad at me but if you will let me put in your suitcase just one little box of that salve for your fingertips so they won't crack pausing as he paced to lay cheek to her hair he patted her three boxes if you want now how's that and you won't take it out so soon as my back is turned cross my heart his touch seemed to set her trembling again all her illy conceived emotions rushing up i can't stand it can't can't take my life take my blood but don't take my boy D -d don't take my boy mamma mamma is that the way you're going to begin all over again after your promise she clung to him heaving against the rising storm of sobs i can't help it C can't cut out my heart from me but let me keep my boy my wonder boy oughtn't she be ashamed of herself just listen to her esther what will we do with her talks like she had a guarantee i wasn't coming back why i wouldn't be surprised if by spring i wasn't tuning up again for a coast-to-coast -coast tour spring that talk don't fool me without my boy the springs in my life are over why ma you talk like every soldier who goes to war was killed there's only the smallest percentage of them die in battle spring he says spring crossing the seas from me to live through months with that sea between us my boy may be shot my mamma please i can't help it leon i'm not one of those fine mothers that can be so brave cut out my heart but leave my boy my wonder boy my child i prayed for there's other mothers ma with sons yes but not wonder sons a genius like you could so easily get excused leon give it up genius it should be the last to be sent to the slaughter pen leon darling don't go ma ma you don't mean what you're saying you wouldn't want me to reason that way you wouldn't want me to hide behind my violin i would would you should wait for the draft with my rudy and even my baby boris enlisted ain't it enough for one mother since they got to be in camp all right i say let them be there if my heart breaks for it but not my wonder child you get the exemption leon right away for the asking stay with me leon don't go away the people at home got to be kept happy with music that's being a soldier too playing their troubles away stay with me leon don't go leave me don't don't he suffered her to lie tear-drenched back into his arms holding her close in his compassion for her his own face twisting god ma his is awful please you make us ashamed all of us i don't know what to say 
Esther, come quiet her. For God's sake, quiet her. From her place in the sobbing circle, Esther Cantor crossed to kneel beside her mother. Mama, darling, you're killing yourself. What if every family went on this way? You want Papa to come in and find us all crying? Is this the way you want Leon to spend his last hour with us? Oh, God, God! I mean his last hour until he comes back, darling. Didn't you just hear him say, darling, it may be by spring? 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 Never no more springs for me. Just think, darling, how proud we should be. Our Leon, who could so easily have been excused, not even to wait for the draft. It's not too late yet. Please, Leon. Our Rudy and Boris both in camp, too, training to serve their country. Why, Mama, we ought to be crying for happiness. As Leon says, surely the Cantor family, who fled out of Russia to escape massacre, should know how terrible slavery can be. That's why we must help our boys, Mama, in their fight to make the world free. Right, Leon? Trying to smile with her red-rimmed eyes. We've got no fight with no one. Not a child of mine was ever raised to so much as lift a finger against no one. We've got no fight with no one. We have got a fight with someone, with autocracy. Only this time it happens to be Hunnish autocracy. You should know it, Mama. Oh, you should know it deeper down in you than any of us. The fight our family right here has got with autocracy. Leon's right, Mama, darling. The way you and Papa were beaten out of your country. There's not a day in your life you don't curse it without knowing it. Every time we three boys look at your son and our brother, Manny, born an, an imbecile because of autocracy, we know what we're fighting for. We know. You know, too. Look at him over there, even before he was born, ruined by autocracy. Know what I'm fighting for? Why, this whole family knows. What's music? What's art? What's life itself in a world without freedom? Every time, Ma, you get to thinking we've got a fight with no one, all you have to do is look at our poor Manny. He's the answer. He's the answer. In a foaming sort of silence, Manny Cantor smiled softly from his chair beneath the pink and gold shade of the piano lamp. The heterogeneous sounds of women weeping had ceased. Straight in her chair, her great shelf of bust heaving, sat Rosa Cantor, suddenly dry of eye. Isidore Cantor, head up, erect now, and out from the embrace of her daughter, Sarah looked up at her son. "'What time do you leave, Leon?' she asked, actually firm of lip. "'Any minute, Ma. Getting late.' This time she pulled her lips to a smile, waggling her forefinger. "'Don't let them little devils of French girls fall in love with my dude in his uniform.' Her pretense of pleasantry was almost more than he could bear. Here, here. Our mother thinks I'm a regular lady killer. Hear that, Esther? Pinching her cheek. You are, Leon. Only, only, you don't know it. Don't you bring down too many bows while I'm gone either, Miss Cantor. I won't, Leon. Sotto voce to her. Remember, Esther, while I'm gone, the royalties from the discophone records are yours. I want you to have them for pen money and, and maybe a dowry. She turned from him. Don't, Leon, don't. I like him. Nice fellow, but slow. Why, if I were in his shoes, I'd have popped long ago. She smiled with her lashes dewy. There entered then, in a violet-scented little whirl, Miss Gina Berg, rosy with the sting of a winter's night, and, as usual, swathed in the high-napped furs. Gina! She was for greeting everyone, a wafted kiss to Mrs. Cantor, and then arms wide, a great bunch of violets in one outstretched hand, her glance straight, sure, and sparkling for Leon Cantor. Surprise, everybody, surprise! Why, Gina, we read, uh, we thought you were singing in Philadelphia tonight. So did I, Esther, darling, until a little bird whispered to me that Lieutenant Cantor was home on farewell leave. He advanced to her down the great length of room, lowering his head over her hand, his puttee-clad legs clicked together. You mean, Miss Gina? Gina, you, you didn't sing? Of course I didn't. Hasn't every prima donna a larynx to hide behind? She lifted off her fur cap, spilling curls. Well, I'll be hanged, said Lieutenant Cantor, 
his eyes lakes of her reflected loveliness she let her hand linger in his leon you really going how terrible how, how wonderful how wonderful you're coming i you think it was not nice of me to come i think it was the nicest thing that ever happened in the world all the way here in the train i kept saying crazy crazy running to tell leon lieutenant canter good-bye when you haven't even seen him three times in three years but each each of those three times we we've remembered gina but that's how i feel toward all the boys leon our fighting boys just like flying to them to kiss them each one good-bye come over gina you'll be a treat to our mother i well i'm hanged all the way from philadelphia there was even a sparkle to talk then and a let-up of pressure after a while sarah cantor looked up at her son tremulous but smiling well son you going to play for your old mother before you go it'll be many a month spring maybe longer before i hear my boy again except on the discophone he shot a quick glance to his sister why i don't know i'd love to ma if you think esther i'd better you don't need to be afraid of me darling there's nothing can give me strength to bear what's before me like like my boy's music that's my life his music why yes if mamma is sure she feels that way play for us leon he was already at the instrument where it lay swathed atop the grand piano what'll it be folks something to make ma laugh leon something light something funny humoresque he said with a quick glance from miss berg humoresque she said smiling back at him he capered through cutting and playful of bow the melody of dvorak's which is as ironic as a grinning mask finished he smiled at his parent her face still untearful how's that it's like life son that piece laughing and making fun of the way just as we think we got we ain't got play that new piece leon the one you set to music you know the words by that young boy in the war who wrote such grand poetry before he was killed the one that always makes poor manny laugh play it for him leon her plump little unlined face innocent of fault mrs isidore cantor ventured her request her smile tired with tears oh no no rosa not now ma wouldn't want that i do son i do even manny would have his share of good-bye to gina berg they want me to play that little setting of mine of alan seeger's poem i have a rendezvous it's it's beautiful leon i was to have sung it on my program to-night only i'm afraid you had better not please leon nothing you play can ever make me as sad as it makes me glad manny should have too his good-bye all right then ma if you're sure you want it will you sing it gina she had risen why yes leon she sang it then quite purely her hands clasped simply together and her glance mistily off the beautiful the heroic the lyrical prophecy of a soldier poet and a poet soldier but i've rendezvoused with death on some scarred slope of battered hill when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear in the silence that followed a sob burst out stifled from esther cantor this time her mother holding her in arms that were strong that leon is the most beautiful of all your compositions what does it mean son that word rendezvous why i i don't exactly know a, a rendezvous is a sort of meeting an engagement isn't it miss gina gina that's it leon an engagement have i an engagement with you gina oh how how i hope you have leon when in the spring that's it in the spring then they smiled these two who had never felt more than the merest butterfly wings of love brushing them light as lashes no word between them only an unfinished sweetness waiting to be linked up suddenly there burst in abram cantor quick leon i got the car downstairs just fifteen minutes to make the ferry quick the sooner we get him over there the sooner we get him back i'm right mamma now 
Now, no waterworks. Get your brother's suitcase, Isidore. Now, now, no nonsense. Quick. With a deftly maneuvered round of goodbyes, a grip-laden dash for door, a throbbing moment of turning back when it seemed as though Sarah Cantor's arms could not unlock their deadlock of him, Leon Cantor was out and gone, the group of faces point-etched into the silence behind him. The poor mute face of Manny laughing softly, Rosa Cantor crying into her hands, Esther grief-crumpled but rich in the enormous hope of youth, the sweet Gina to whom the waiting months had already begun their reality. Not so, Sarah Cantor, in a bedroom adjoining, its high ceiling vastness as cold as a cathedral to her lowness of stature, sobs dry and terrible were rumbling up from her, only to dash against lips tightly restraining them on her knees beside a chest of drawers and unwrapping it from swaddling clothes she withdrew what at best had been a sorry sort of fiddle cracked of back and solitary of string it was as if her trembling arms raising it above her head would make of themselves and her swaying body the tripod of an altar the old twisting and prophetic pain was behind her heart like the painted billows of music that the old Italian masters loved to do, there wound and wreathed about her clouds of song. But I've a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill, when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear. End of Story 9, Part 2《Story Ten of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Story Ten, The Lubbany Kiss by Louise Rice from Ainsley's Magazine. For many hours the hot July sun had beaten down upon the upland meadows and the pine woods of the lower New Jersey hills so when the dew began to fall there arose from them a heady brew distilled from blossoming milkweed and fruiting wild raspberry canes and mountain laurel and dried pine needles the princess dora pars took this perfume into her lusty young lungs and blew it out again in a long sigh after which she bent her first finger over her thumb as one must when one returns what all romanes know to be the breath of god she did this almost unconsciously for all her faculties were busied in another matter the eyes of a gorgio weakened by an indoor life would never have been able to distinguish the small object for which the princess looked for she was perched up on the high seat of the red romany vardo and she drove her two strong shaggy horses with a free and careless hand but to dora pars the blur of vague shadows gliding by each wheel was not vague at all suddenly she checked her horse and sprang down the pattern for which she was looking was laid beneath a clump of the flowering weed which the romanes call stars in the sky the gorgios know it as queen anne's lace and the farmers curse it by the name of the wild carrot the pattern was like a miniature log cabin without a roof and across the top one large stick was laid, pointing upward along the mountain road. Two brown and slender fingers on the big braid which dropped over her shoulder, the princess meditated, a shiver of fear running through her. What, she asked herself, could this mean? Why, for the first time in years, were the wagons to go to the farm of Jan Jacobus? Even if it were only a chance happening, it was a most unfortunate one, for young Jan, the fair-haired giant son of old Jacobus, with his light blue eyes and his drawling, insolent speech, was the last person in the world that she wanted to see, especially with her man near. For she had meant no harm. Many and many a time she had smiled into the eyes of men and felt pride in her power over them. Still, and yet, the princess scattered the pattern with her foot, for she knew that all the wagons must be ahead of her, since she had lagged so, and she leaped to her seat with one easy, lithe swing, and drove on up the darkening road. 
Jan Jacobus, like several other descendants of the Dutch settlers of New Jersey, held his upland farm on shares with John Lane's tribe of gypsies. Jacobuses and Bantas and Kops, they made no bones about having business dealings with the tribe of the English Romanies, which had followed a regular route twice a year from Maryland to the upper part of New Jersey since before the beginning of the revolutionary days. The descendants of the English settlers, the Hardys, the Lesters, the Vincents, and the Ferrens, looked with still persisting English reserve upon the roamers of the woods and would have no traffic with them, though a good many of their sons and daughters had to know the few Romany young people who were left by twos and threes in the towns for occasional years of schooling the tribe trading in land in the two states which they frequented and breeding horses was very rich but not very many people knew that however they were conceded to be shrewd bargainers and when old john bought martin devon's upland and rocky farm one year with the money that he had made by a lucky purchase of a gangling colt whose owner had failed rightly to appraise its possibilities as a racer Boonton and Dover and Morristown laughed. Sal away, old John retorted pleasantly to the cashier of the bank in Boonton, where the tribe had deposited its surplus funds for many years. But you won't sal so much when you dick what I will make out of that joke. The cashier thereupon looked thoughtful. It might well be that he and others would not laugh when they saw good fortune, which might have been theirs following this genial old outlaw. That summer the wagons camped on the Devons' place, and old John stocked it with a lot of fine hogs, for which the land was especially adapted. They fattened on the many acres, wooded with wild nut-trees and Jacobus, as keen a bargainer as any Romany, upon whom John Lane had had his eyes all the time, took the farm on shares, and every year thereafter the cashier at the bank added a neat little total to the big balance which the tribe was rolling up. And every year, as the wagons beat up toward Dover in July, old John would drive on ahead and spend a night of mingled business and pleasure with old Jan, reckoning up the profits on the Berkshires, for which the farm was now famous, and putting down big mugs of the black drink, for which Auntie Alice Lee, John Lane's ancient cousin, was equally famous. The amount of this fiery and head-splitting liquor which the two old men thus got away with was afterward gleefully recounted in the wagons and fearfully whispered of in the little Dutch church at Horse's Neck, which the Jacobuses had attended for over a hundred years. But never, as wagon after wagon had gone up the turning that led to the upward farm, had there been a pateran pointing that way always it had shown the way onward and downward to the little hamlet of rockaway where there was an old and friendly camping place back of the blacksmith shop beyond the church old john never encouraged the wagons to visit any of the properties held by the tribe silver blackens the salt of friendship he would say dora parse was driving her own vardo a very fine one which had belonged to her mother Lester Montague of Sea-Tac, Maryland, who makes the wagons of Romanese for all the Atlantic Coast tribes, like his father before him, had done an especially good job of it. The princess had been certified by the Romany rites to old John's eldest son, George, for she had flatly refused to be married according to the Gorgio ways. Not having been married a full year, he was not yet entitled to carry the heavy silver-topped stick which is the badge of the married man, nor could he demand a place in his wife's tent or wagon unless she expressly invited him. Dora Pars and George Lane were passionately in love with each other, and their meeting and mating had been the flowering romance of the tribe the previous summer. The princess, being descended from a very old Romany family, as her name showed, was far higher in rank than any one in the Lane tribe. Her aristocratic lineage showed in the set of her magnificent head, in the small delicate fingers of her hand, and in the fire and richness of her eyes. Also her skin was of the color of old ivory, upon which is cast a distant faint reflection of the sunset, 
and her mouth, thinner than those of most Romanies, was of the color of a ripe pomegranate. A rani a puro rani, all the tribes of the eastern coast murmured respectfully when Dora Parse's name was mentioned. She was indeed a very great lady, but she was a flirtatious and headstrong girl. She was one of the few modern gypsies who still hold to the unadulterated worship of those all the members of john lane's tribe were methodists had been since before they had migrated from england in every wagon save dora's a large illustrated bible lay on a little table and those who could read them aloud to the rest of a sunday afternoon this did not mean however that the romanies had descended to gorgio ways or that they had wholly left off their attentions to those they combined the two old john was known as a fervent and eloquent leader in prayer at the wednesday night prayer meetings in the maryland town where his church membership was held but he had not ceased to carry the box of meanings as befitted the chief of the tribe this was a very beautifully worked box of pure gold made by the great nicola of budapest whose boxes can be found inside the shirt of every gypsy chief where they are always carried in them are some grains of wheat garnered by moonlight a peacock's feather and a small silver bell with a coiled snake for a handle when anything is to be decided a few of the grains are taken out and counted if they are even the omen is bad but if they are odd all is well old john had an elastic and accommodating mind like all romanies so he never thought it strange that he should ask the box of meanings whether or not it was going to storm on prayer meeting nights dora pars thought of the box now and wished that she might have the peacock's feather for a minute so that her uneasy sense of impending bad luck would leave her then she stopped beside a cross-barred gate where an old man was evidently waiting for her lane was getting troubled about ya he said as he turned the horses and peered curiously up at her he knew who she was not only because john lane had said who it was who was late but because dora parse's appearance was well known to the whole countryside she was the only member of the tribe who kept to the full romany dress there were big gold loops in her small ears and on her arms many gold bracelets whose lightness testified to their freedom from alloy her skirt was of red heavily embroidered in blue and her waist with short sleeves was of sheer white cloth with an embroidered bolero her hair she wore in the ancient fashion in two braids on either side of her face she could well afford to the schiths muttered among themselves any girl with hair like that there was a long lane leading to the barns and to the meadow back of them and there said jan the tribe was to camp as the princess drove along the short distance she swiftly snatched off her little bolero put it on wrong side out and then snatched it off and righted it that much at least she could do to avert ill luck and her heart bounded as she drove in among the other wagons for her husband came running to meet her and held out his arms she dropped into them and laid each finger-tip delicately in succession upon his eyes and his ears and his mouth the seal of a betrothal and the sign whereby a romany shawl may know that a shy intends to accept him when he speaks for her before the tribe a sign that lovers repeat as a sacred and intimate caress she leaned hard into his arms and he held her pressing the tender confidential kiss that is given to children behind her little ear dora pars suddenly ran both hands through his thick hair and gave it a little pull she always did that when her spirits rose then she turned and looked at the scene and at once she knew that there was to be some special occasion auntie alice lee was seated by a cooking fire on which stood the enormous iron pot in which the big meals were prepared when the tribe was to eat together and not in separate groups as it usually did there were some boards laid on wooden horses and pyramus lee auntie's grandson was bringing blocks of wood from the woodshed for seats dora pars clapped her hands with delight and looked at her man 
"Techo!" she exclaimed, approvingly, using the word that spells all degrees of satisfaction. "And what is it for, stickless one? Is it to talk over silver?" "Yes, it is some business," George Lane replied. "But first there will be a _gillie shoon_." A _gillie shoon_ has its counterpart in the English word "sing song," as it is beginning to be used now, with this exception Romanys have few fixed songs. They have strains which are set, which every one knows, but a _gillie shoon_ means that the performers improvise continually, and in this sense it is a mystic ceremony never held at an appointed time, except a time of Mozartus, which really means a sort of religious wave of feeling, which strikes tribe after tribe, usually in the spring. "'Marda has come back,' Auntie Lee called out to Dora Pars. No one ever called her by her full name of Marda Lee, because she was a Lee only by courtesy, having been adopted from a distant wagon when both her parents were killed in a thunderstorm. Marda, wearing the trim tailored skirt and waist that were her usual costume, was putting the big red tablecloth of the big meals on the boards. Dora went quickly toward the young girl and embraced her. "'How is our little scholar?' she asked affectionately. "'I am very well, Dora Pars, but a little tired,' Marda answered. "'And did you receive another paper?' "'Yes, I passed my exams. It will save me half a year in Dover.' "'That is good,' Dora Pars replied, although she had only the dimmest idea of what Marda meant. The young girl knew that. She had just come from taking a special course in Columbia, and she was feeling the breach between herself and her people to be especially wide. Because of that, perhaps, she also felt more loving toward all of them than she ever had, and especially toward Dora, about whom she knew something that was most alarming. Dora Pars noted the pale, grave face of her favorite friend with concern. "'Smile, bird of my heart,' she entreated, "'for we are to have a gillie shoon. Sit near me, that I may follow your heaven voice.' There was no flattery meant. The Romanes called the soprano the heaven voice, the tenor the sky voice, the contralto the earth voice, and the basso the sea voice. Dora had a really wonderful earth voice, almost as wonderful as Marta's heaven voice, which would have been remarkable even among opera singers, and the two were known everywhere for their improvisations. In answer to the remark of the princess, Marta gave her a strange look and said, I shall be near you, Dora Pars, do not forget. Her manner was certainly peculiar, the princess thought, as she walked away. But then one never knew what Marta was thinking about. Her great education set her apart from others. Any Chai, who habitually read herself to sleep over those most pure libros, the works of William Shakespeare in eight volumes, complete with glossary and appendix, must not be judged by ordinary standards. The princess knew the full title of those puro libros, having painfully spelled it out all one rainy afternoon in Marta's mother's wagon, with repeated assistance and explanations from Marta, which had left the princess with a headache. Now Auntie Lee took off the heavy iron cover of the pot, and the odor of Romany duck stew, than which there is nothing in the world more appetizing, mingled with the sweet fragrance of the drying hay. Auntie thrust a fork as long as a poker into the bubbling mass, and then gave the call that brings the tribe in a hurry. Impo, she said in her shrill, cracked voice. Impo, impo. Laughing, teasing, jostling, talking, they all came, spilling out from the wagons, running from the barn, sauntering in, the lovers, by twos, and sat down before the plates heaped high with the duck and the vegetables with which it was cooked, and the big loaves of Italian bread which the Romanes like and always buy as they pass through towns where there are Italian bakeries. But they sat quiet then, and each one looked toward the princess, as politeness demanded, since she was the highest in rank among them. She drew a sliver of meat from her plate and tossed it over her shoulder. To the great A, she said. To the shrewd, each one murmured. 
Then, having paid their compliments to the sun and the moon, as all good Romanys must before eating, they fell to with heartiness. When they were through, the mothers and the old men cleared away the tables and put the younger children to bed in the wagons, and the princess and George Lane and Marta and young Adam Lane, George's youngest brother, walked up and down outside the glow from the cooking fire, taking the deep, full breaths which cleanse the mouth and prepare the soul for the ecstasy of song. The men took away the tables and the lanterns which had been standing about, and put out the cooking fire, for the big moon was rolling up over the treetops, and Romany sing by her light alone, if they can. Frogs were calling in the shallow stretches of the upper rockaway. People began to sit down in a big circle. Then Marda started the Gilichun. At first you could not have been sure whether the sound was far or near, for she covered her tones in a way that many a Giorgio gives years and much silver to learn. Then the wonderful tones swelled out, as if an organ stop were being pulled open, and one by one the four leaders cast in the dropping notes which followed and sustained the theme that Marda was weaving. La la la, ya la la la, ya ya la lu. Old John, who had not appeared before, slid into the circle, holding by the sleeve a giant of a man who seemed to come half unwillingly. Dora Parr saw him, and she could not repress the shiver that ran through her at the sight of young Jan Jacobus, yet she sang on. The deep, majestic basses throbbed out the foundation of the great fugue-like chorus, and the soprano soared and soared until they were singing falsetto, according to Giorgio's standards, only it sounded like the sweetly piercing high notes of violins, and the tenors and contraltos wove a garland of glancing melody between the two. They were all singing now, rocking back and forth a little, swaying gently from side to side, lovers clasped together mothers in their young sons arms and fathers clasping their daughters they sent out to the velvet arch above them the heart cry of a race proud and humble cleanly voluptuous strong and cruel passionate and loving elemental like the north wind and subtle as the fragrance of a poppy i la lu i la la lu la la i lu Jan Jacobus sat with his big jaw dropping. Stupid boor that he was, he could not have explained the terrifying effect which this wild music and those tense, uplifting faces had upon him, but he would have given anything to be back in his mother's kitchen, with the lamp lit and the dark, unfamiliar night shut out. As suddenly as the singing had begun, it stopped. People coughed, moved a little, whispered to one another. Then George Lane stood upon his feet, pulling Dora Pars with him. "'You see her?' he asked them all, holding out his wife in his arms. Dora Pars knew then, for he was beginning the ritual of the man or woman who accuses a partner before the tribe of unfaithfulness. He was using the most pure Romany jib, for only so can the serious affairs of the tribe tribunal be conducted. Dora Pars struggled in the strong hands of her man. No, no, she cried, no, no. You see her, George Lane repeated to the circle. We see her, they answered in a murmur that ran around from end to end. She is mine, she is yours. What shall be done to her if she has lost the spirit of our love? Again Dora Pars furiously struggled, but George Lane held her. What shall be done with her, if that is so? Auntie Lee, as the oldest woman present, now took up the replies, as was her right and duty. Let her go to the other, if she wishes, and do you close your tent and your wagon against her. And if she does not wish, then punish her. What shall be done to the man? Is he a Romany? No. Jan Jacobus half started up, but strong hands instantly jerked him down. He is a Giorgio? Yes. Do nothing. We do not soil our hands with Giorgios. Let the woman bear the blame. She is a Romany. She should have known better. She is a woman, the wiser sex. It is her fault. Let her be punished. 
"'Do you all say so?' George Lane demanded. "'We say so.' Again the rippling murmur. Jan Jacobus made a desperate attempt to get on his feet, but for all his strength he might as well have tried to uncoil the folds of a great snake as to unbind the many hands that held him, for the Romanis have as many secret ways of restraining a person as the Japanese. George Lane drew his wife tenderly close to him. "'She shall be punished,' he said. "'But first she shall hear, before you all, that I love her and that I know she has not lost the spirit of our love. Her fault was born of lightness of heart and vanity, not of evil.' "'What is her fault? Name it.' commanded Auntie Lee. George Lane looked over at Jan. Her fault is that she trusted a Giorgio to understand the ways of a Romany. For our girls have the spirit of love in their eyes, but no man among us would kiss a girl unless he received the sign from her. But the Giorgio men are without honor. Today, as this woman who is mine stopped to talk with the Giorgio among some trees where I waited, thinking to enter her wagon there, he kissed her, and she kissed him in return. Not with the Lubini kiss, not with that kiss, Dora Pars cried. May I be lost as Pharaoh was on the sea if I speak not the truth. The solemn oath, never taken by any Romany lightly, and never falsely sworn to, rang out on the still night air. A cold but firm little hand was slipped into Dora Pars's. Marda was near, as she had promised, and the hot palm of the princess closed gratefully upon it. George Lane drew his wife upon his breast, and over her glossy head he looked for encouragement to Auntie Lee, who knew what he must do. He was very pale, but he must not hesitate. "'Kiss me, my love,' he said loudly and clearly, "'here before my people, that I may punish you. Give me the kiss of love, when tongues and lips meet, that you may know your fault.' Now Dora Pars grew very pale, too, and she leaned far back against her man's arms, her eyes wide with terror. And no one spoke, for in all the history of the tribe this thing had never happened before, though everyone had heard of it. Dora Pars knew that, if she refused, her oath would be considered false, and she would be cast out, not only from her husband's tent and wagon, but from all Romany tribes and slowly she leaned forward, and George Lane bent down. Jan Jacobus, although he had not understood the words of the ritual, thought he knew what had happened. The gypsy fool was forgiving his pretty wife. The young Dutchman settled back on his haunches, suddenly aware that he was no longer held. And then, with all the others, he sprang to his feet, for Dora Pars was hanging in her husband's arm, with blood pouring from her mouth, and George Lane was sobbing aloud as he called her name. "'What, what, what happened?' Jan stammered. "'God, did he kill her?' Old John Lane, his serene face unruffled, turned the bewildered and frightened boy toward the lane, and spoke in the silky, incisive tones which were half of his enchanting charm. Nothing much has happened. One of our girls allowed a Giorgio to kiss her, so her man bit off the tip of her tongue. It is not necessary often to do it, but it is not a serious matter. It will soon heal. She will be able to talk, a little. It is really nothing, but I thought you might like to see it. It is seldom that Giorgios are allowed to see a thing like that. Please say to your father that I will spend the evening as usual with him. My people will pass on. End of story 10